My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We Christians have a funny relationship with our bodies and the world. Some suggest we are to deny the flesh and to flee the things of this world. That somehow the physical world is but a chain that bonds us to the here and now and prevents us from fully loving God. Similarly, there are others who see the Christian way of life as simply an intellectual or highly spiritualized tradition whereby we transcend the world and enter into the pure realm of God some are far out there. Faith, as they see it, is a means to fulfillment and enlightenment. Both of these ways are not only erroneous, heretical presentations of the Christian way of life, they are extremely dangerous, if not confronted or challenged. The first way leads us to a puritanical understanding of the body and human sexuality. It abuses persons who do not conform to gender or sexual norms, such as queer and transgendered youth. All of us, in one way or another, have been wounded by this way of thinking, leading many of us to feel ashamed of our bodies and sexuality. Millions suffer from a sense of inadequacy and spend billions of dollars on the cosmetic, dieting, and fitness industries to achieve the perfect look. We hide our blemishes and slave away at gyms, all in the hope of attaining the perfect and sculpted body. The other way of thought, the way of enlightenment and fulfillment, leads many to a narcissistic kind of faith. Faith is simply a means to personal perfection and wealth. This is a way of Christianity that you will often find in the religion sections of bookstores, or you will see it in American evangelical Christianity, which often proclaims a prosperity gospel Love, your, live your best life now is its model, and its practice is consumerist Christianity. Members are told that their faithfulness to God is measured by their wealth and success in life. This way is also deeply wounded people, particularly the poor and those who feel the weight of tragedy and despair each and every day. God, in their eyes, seems not to care for them. It is also disconnected believers from the pain and suffering others experience. Take, for example, the person who complains about having to pay two dollars a liter of gas while driving their extraordinary large car and drinking a five dollar cup of latte. Such a person is divorced from the suffering in the world and incapable of seeing the pain and agony experienced by those living in war-torn countries such as Ukraine. There is, however, another way of Christianity that neither despises the body nor flees to fantasy land. It is the way found in the scriptures, particularly the Gospels, in which love inhabits the body and the body becomes gift for others. It is the way of Jesus. We see it enfleshed in our story today from the Gospel of John. 
Now to help us better understand the story that we just heard proclaimed by Chris, the story of Mary washing Jesus' feet with oil in her hair, we have to con consider the context of the story. After three years of proclaiming the good news of God's justice and peace for all, and healing countless women and men, Jesus is on his final return trip to Jerusalem. He stops in a small village, three kilometers or so from Jerusalem, called Bethany, and is met by two women. Martha and Mary, whose brother Lazarus had died, the women are grief-stricken, so much so that even Jesus is moved to tears when he encounters these two women. It's actually one of the most beautiful scenes in all of the Gospels. He breaks down in tears. Moved by the sisters' pleas for his help, Jesus performs his final and greatest miracle, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It would be the one last thing that would seal his own death. In giving life to the mortal body of Lazarus, Jesus' own body would suffer the pain of trial, torture, and death. Death of a criminal. And as history has shown us, time and time again, people kill the prophets of justice, peace, and life. I want you for a moment to imagine with me. Imagine with me the pain that Jesus must have felt at this point. He knew that what he had just done likely sealed his death. He knew that this likely was going to be his last and final journey. Although the crowds around Jesus rejoice because Lazarus is, is alive, and so do Martha and Mary, Jesus feels extraordinary anguish. Among those gathered at the banquet, few even get what he is going through. Most are too consumed by their own thoughts and feelings. And others, such as the disciples, were more likely concerned with practical matters. All fail to notice Jesus in pain and agony, except for one woman, Mary of Bethany, Lazarus' sister. Mary senses and feels deep in her body Jesus' anxiety as his time of trial draws near. Now this scene, <laughs> This scene is actually probably one of the most controversial scenes in all of the Gospels. It breaks every cultural norm and rule of the day. Everything. It would have been entirely scandalous. She risked it all. In her day, a woman would never drop her hair down. That was a sign of a divorced woman. She is about to take an extraordinary risk and do something so profoundly intimate that only few would ever see. Yet she has compassion for him. A love that swells up from the very depth of her heart and soul and body. Her compassion compels her to open a jar of precious oil and lavishly pours it on Jesus' feet. And then she does something extraordinary. She leans down and washes his feet with her hair. Picture it. In the midst of this banquet, this woman lets everything out and is so moved by love for this man, this man who is in agony, this man who knows 
that death is his final end, she goes down and washes his feet with her hair. Mary gets Jesus. Well before Jesus gives his command to love one another as he has loved us and to wash each other's feet, Mary embodies perfect love in her sensual, compassionate care for Jesus. Her, her, her whole entire body is consumed in this. It's an extraordinary, beautiful act of love, embodied love. Now for the author of this gospel, St. John, the physicality of this scene is intentional. John has a certain fleshiness to his gospel. He is the one for whom the word, that is God, becomes incarnate, takes on flesh in Jesus. God is embodied in Jesus. And that detail is important. The body becomes a sacramental, a means for God to tangibly manifest God's grace in the world. Our bodies become the very instruments in which God shows God's self to us. Think of that for a moment. Your body is holy, beautiful, wondrously made. John returns in the scene to the very beginning of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, the book of Genesis. It reminds all of us that creation including the human body, is good. And it is in the very image of God. And for that body and all of creation to find its fulfillment, its ultimate purpose, he must give of itself as give to others for life the world. But others could not see what Mary saw. They were all too occupied with their own fears and concerns. Judas, most of all. It is in this context that Jesus responds with that rather troubling and alarming line where he says, you always will have the poor with you, but you do not have me. Before I say more, I want to give you a clue. Jesus is not disregarding the poor. Instead, he's challenging his disciples to see the poor right before them and to give of themselves body and soul to their care, to give everything of who they are, to care for the suffering and the poor, the broken, the wounded, to give everything. He wants to see, the, have the disciples see the suffering before them. The suffering he feels in the poverty of spirit that fills his heart. Moreover, he wants them to see the poor woman who nearly lost her brother, and likely will in the future. His response is not so much a declarative, but an imperative. See the poor and the suffering before you. One scholar affirms the possibility of this. She notes the verb Jesus uses in Greek can be translated either as declarative, you always have, or the imperative, keep the poor always before you. Given the scene in Jesus' entire ministry to the poor and marginalized, in which, by the way, Jesus devoted his whole life to the poor and marginalized. That was his work. I much rather believe Jesus is challenging his disciples to not ignore the poor before them, but to always be attentive to them. And as a good Jewish, Jewish man, such a message is in keeping with the law of Moses. For in Deuteronomy 15.11, the Jewish people are commanded to always care for the poor who are always before them. Ultimately, the story of Mary's anointing on Jesus' feet 
is a lived expression of Jesus' entire ministry. Be always attentive to those before you and love them as I have loved you. Give of yourselves, your entire bodies and souls, your spirits, everything that makes you who you are. Give of yourself to those who suffer pain, anguish. Embody love in your care for the poor, the anguish, the abused, the forgotten. Let us be a living sacrifice of love for all of God's people. I think the Book of Common Prayer gets us best. After the people of God have received Holy Communion, we join together in quoting St. Paul, and we say and do as Jesus calls us to do. And we pray. Here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. Amen.